a little bit. Hi, I am Christian Stevenson with the Mississippi State University Extension Service in Hancock County, joining you for another online presentation. Uh, thank you very much for joining me today and very much appreciated as well if you were watching the recording of this that is put up on YouTube. If you are watching on YouTube, please feel free to ask any questions you may have down in the comments section, or of course, you're always welcome to get in touch with me uh, at the contact information that's put here on this first slide. So feel free to give me a call, send me an email, uh, but certainly if it's convenient for you, you can just put that uh, question down in the comment section uh, and I will get to you to answer that question. I would also encourage you hit the subscribe button so you can find out about future presentations uh, that I upload. Uh, so today we are going to be talking about integrated pest management. Uh, and uh, we'll talk a little bit about the history behind it uh, and the philosophy of integrated pest management. Uh, and it shouldn't be a, a big surprise to you uh, that if you see um, you know, some of the, the things that I'm going to discuss today uh, have been discussed in some of the previous videos that we've done. Uh, because all of those things are incorporated into this idea of integrated pest management, which is the use of uh, multiple different strategies to approach the, the control or, or management of not only insect pests, uh, but also diseases and weeds and uh, really the, the entire culture of plants. Uh, so I want to begin uh, just talking a little bit about the history of pest management in general. Uh, certainly, as long as people have been involved in growing crops, uh, they have also been involved in uh, fending off threats to those crops, uh, including insects and diseases and weeds. Uh, and so our record of pest management uh, really goes back as far as our written history. Uh, so it goes back to uh, the Sumerians, Mesopotamia, uh, and uh, they would actually use sulfur compounds uh, in order to control insects. Uh, that is absolutely a material that is still used uh, even in 2021 uh, and can still be effective for management of some problems that we have. Um, there's also early records uh, going back to 100 and, uh, or 1500 BC uh, discussing the manipulation of planting dates, so planting early in order to avoid higher populations of pests, or in some cases planting a little bit later uh, in order to uh, you know, avoid some early season problems. Uh, going a little bit for, further forward than that, uh, or the, the, the first uses of botanical insecticides uh, for seed treatments were used in China. Uh, somewhat later, uh, to, uh, they, they used uh, extracts of different plants to actually spray uh, onto crops as a method to control pests. Uh, going, uh, uh, you know, getting into uh, Europe a little bit, uh, going back to 470 uh, BC, uh, there is a reference to uh, Democritus, and uh, this was cited by Pliny, um, using a material called Amurka, uh, and I certainly do not know if I'm pronouncing that correctly, uh, as a method to control blight on plants, so uh, uh, disease control. Amurka is a uh, liquid waste material uh, that's produced in, uh, for, uh, as part of the process of making olive oil. Um, also, some really early examples uh, of using biological control uh, using ants in order to uh, actually introducing ant colonies into citrus orchards uh, to control caterpillars and other pests. Also have references to sprays of oils for pest control. Um, as we get into uh, certainly a little bit more recently, um, there are old texts dealing with pest management going back to uh, the year 1100, uh, the uh, Kitab al-Falaha, a uh, very important document uh, that, that uh, comes out of the uh, out of what we would call the Middle East uh, that uh, broadly talked about agriculture, but also included a great deal of information uh, on uh, on pest management. Uh, 
Uh, on, on a slightly different note, uh, there are also records, and, and this is not the only case of this, uh, but in 1476, uh, the Archbishop of Bern uh, put uh, cutworms on uh, a uh, uh, ecumenical trial, and, and they were excommunicated uh, in order to get rid of them. I, I don't have any information about whether that was effective, uh, but uh, certainly shows the importance of dealing with these pests. Um, getting sort of more into the modern era, uh, Linnaeus, who is uh, famous for having uh, put together the, the binomial system of nomenclature that we use in taxonomy. So Carolus Linnaeus is a very famous uh, early biologist. Um, uh, published uh, a num published a uh, essay uh, that specifically dealt with uh, uh, with pest management. Um, so, um, you know, one of the really you know sort of interesting cases in um, in sort of the early modern era uh, in pest management is uh, the control of grape phylloxera and powdery mildew. Uh, in the French wine industry, uh, you can see a picture there of uh, Bordeaux mixture, uh, which is uh, really important uh, for uh, control of uh, powdery mildew. Paris green is a uh, uh, was an important compound as well, uh, dealing with grape phylloxera. So the, the problem was so serious uh, that they actually had to resort to importing uh, American or North American. Um, uh, rootstock in order to uh, provide a little bit of resistance to this problem as well. Uh, now, as we get into the uh, the 1900s, I guess now, um, you know, particularly as we get into the 30s and 40s, uh, the age of chemistry really came in, uh, and so DDT, uh, which of course is is very was made very famous. Uh, as an insecticide uh, began to be used in the, uh, the late 1930s and through, uh, uh, through the 40s and 50s uh, for insect control, particularly for control of mosquitoes um, because of the, the extreme importance of controlling uh, mosquito vectors for malaria, typhus, uh, and other diseases. So uh, certainly DDT became very famous later and we'll discuss that a little bit. Um, but it was also really important um, because of its, its role in, uh, in reducing those mosquito populations uh, and uh, in preserving human life in that way. Um, as we get through the 1940s, you have the development of the organophosphate and carbamate pesticides. Uh, some of those are still in use today, though many of them are, are no longer used or heavily restricted for their use. Uh, because of potential toxicity. Uh, and as we really, you know, we'll talk about this a little bit more, but as we get into the 50s, you know, the recognition of, you know, the potential environmental uh, impacts of the application of pesticides uh, is certainly, you know, not something that is, is really, you know, very recent. Uh, as we got into the 50s, uh, that's really where we start seeing um, a big response and, you know, uh, an adaption or, or meth, you know, interest in controlling or limiting those pesticide applications uh, and the, the introduction of the idea of integrated control. Uh, uh, Bacillus thuringiensis, which is now a, a common uh, organic insecticide, was introduced in the 60s. Uh, we're going to talk a little bit more about the book Silent Spring. It was written by Rachel Carson. Um, because that had a, a significant impact on the, the public perception uh, and, and public engagement in the environmental movement. Uh, so integrated pest management as a, a formulated idea or program really started out in the 1920s. Uh, so even before we're getting into the, the development of a lot of the uh, chemical uh, chemical pest control methods that we're more familiar with uh, really started off in California in in cotton production. So really agronomic and large scale production of cotton. 
uh, as supervised control. So, uh, so trained entomologists uh, would periodically, you know, you know, investigate pest populations, uh, natural enemy, or what I would generally call beneficial insect populations. Uh, and then recommend the use of pesticides really only when they were necessary. Uh, and this really heavily contrasted with, with the previous approach, which, which is what it, which is to use either a, a simple calendar or sort of insurance application uh, of applying those pesticides without really knowing whether the pest was there or not. Uh, so very early 1939 in a, a paper by Hoskins et al. Uh, recommended that biological and chemical control should be used supplementary to, it, to each other uh, to balance with the balance of nature providing the major part of protection from pests needed for successful agriculture. Uh, and I, I think that's a really good initial formulation of the approach of integrated pest management using all of these different techniques together. Of course, as we get into the 30s and 40s, uh, there is the development of a lot of synthetic organic insecticides. Uh, and just for clarity there, um, there, there are different ways that the word organic gets used. So um, in, in common parlance, when people say organic, when they refer to gardening, uh, they, they tend to refer to things that are derived from some natural process. Uh, when chemists use the term organic, uh, they're really referring to, to carbon-based and, and you know, chemistry involving cyclic rings of carbon. Uh, so uh, just a little bit of a difference in the use of that term. Uh, but regardless of that, uh, you know, the development of all of these chemistries uh, and they're you know, very high efficacy. They're, they're really you know, very, very effective, led to a tendency to just rely on over application of these chemical pesticides, sort of to the detriment of non-chemical methods. So you know, if you have that tool that works really extensively, doesn't involve a lot of labor, uh, there is a, a motivation or a justification for relying on that method. Uh, but you know, even as we get into the 50s, uh, you start to see concerns uh, in, in the scientific community and in the agricultural community uh, about reliance on those chemical pest controls, you know, starting in the 1950s. Uh, and the development of integrated pest management um, is largely a response to that. So uh, IPM or you know, integrated pest management, I'll, I'll often abbreviate it IPM, uh, really is that initial step in, um, in making our, uh, our approach to agriculture and, and managing pests and diseases and weeds uh, in agriculture and horticulture and gardening uh, sustainable uh, and, uh, and uh, you know, working well with the environment. And you know, certainly there was a, a lot of push for that uh, enough that in 1972, uh, no less than President Richard Nixon, uh, who uh, was addressing Congress, uh, in, included in his environmental protection agenda, uh, the adoption of integrated pest management. So uh, I did say that I was going to mention this a little bit more in uh, uh, more than in passing. Silent Spring was a, a very important book uh, in terms of the environmental movement, um, because it really addressed the concerns uh, about you know, the ecological con uh, consequences of indiscriminate pesticide use. Uh, and it did that in uh, admittedly fairly dramatic language um, and, and certainly with a, with a lot of emotion as well as presenting the problem. Uh, and so it was very successful in raising awareness in the general public uh, about the, these concerns uh, and, and certainly advanced the environmental movement, especially here in the United States. Uh, so, uh, you know, certainly, you know, one of the very common pesticides uh, that were used at the time was DDT. Uh, and DDT, of course, became very famous. Uh, because of its impacts in bioaccumulating in, into birds 
uh, which would then result in, uh, in weakened egg shells, uh, which could negatively impact bird populations. Uh, and you know, that sort of awareness and that sort of, uh, of consciousness of potential environmental impacts uh, has really been a large part of the drive uh, to integrated pest management uh, and adopting uh, methodologies to, to integrate you know, multiple forms of control rather than simply relying on, uh, on uh, chemistry. Now, uh, there is sort of a, an idea uh, that, that people were completely unconscious of, of the potential uh, harm or the potential environmental uh, effects or, or potential toxicity of, of the chemicals. Uh, and I don't think that, that that's really a fair uh, estimation. Uh, you know, certainly, uh, uh, you know, people were aware that there were potential negative impacts uh, to those uh, pesticides, but, uh, you know, they, that had to be weighed against the potential uh, good that was done uh, by their application. Uh, so one of the big issues that gets faced uh, by uh, the, the over application of pesticides is the development of resistance in insect populations. So uh, you have a, a pesticide that is very effective. You have a crop that is infested with pests. Um, you apply that pesticide and it, you know, with, with a large population of insects, um, you are, you know, very likely going to eliminate a large proportion of that insect population. But some members of that population are, are going to have a little bit more ability to tolerate uh, that pesticide uh, than, uh, than the others in that population do. Uh, and because they're the only ones left, as the population recovers, um, that quality uh, really uh, uh, you know, propagates in the population. Uh, and so over time, what you do is you build up that resistance. So it's important to take some steps in order to prevent this from occurring, uh, not only because we, we don't want to have to continually apply more of the pesticide uh, or ap apply it more frequently. Uh, so in agriculture, there are several different approaches that are used uh, to you know, sort of prevent that resistance from developing, uh, either using alternating chemistries so that you have uh, you know, the population's unable to build up uh, a resistance to one, uh, one pesticide. Uh, another technique is to use refuges uh, where you don't apply a control so that you uh, retain, um, you know, that, that resistance as a smaller proportion of the population. So all of that, that's sort of an important point. Uh, but again, you know, when we really want to talk about the principle of integrated pest management, uh, what we want to talk about is, is using multiple controls uh, cooperatively in order to, uh, to uh, limit the need for pesticides. Uh, we want to use as many cultural methods as we possibly can, uh, and we'll talk about some of that. Uh, we want to do monitoring for pest populations. We don't want to spray a, a pesticide when we don't need to spray one. Uh, and that will, so we'll talk a little bit about economic thresholds or action thresholds as well. Uh, but, you know, with that, we do still need to implement controls when the population reaches a level uh, that's going to be damaging to what we're growing. Uh, after that, you know, the, you know our, our process isn't really done because we still want to evaluate the efficacy of what we're doing. How well are we doing at control? Uh, did what we, you know, did the action we take actually benefit us? Uh, and, you know, one thing that I always add to this uh, is I think keeping records is really important. Uh, taking notes, letting you know what is effective and what's not been effective for you, uh, because that's going to help you make judgments in the future. Uh, and you can kind of see from this image that I have here on the, uh, uh, the right of your screen, you know, we start off with cultural methods. Uh, because that, that really starts with plant selection uh, and planting, uh, we can move on to considering mechanical controls, whether we can use barriers, 
uh, we, we have natural or, or uh, biological control uh, through the use of natural enemies or beneficial insects. Uh, and still, you know, if we still have options beyond that, uh, we can apply a, uh, a chemical control in order to, fi to finally address the issue. And I think it's important to note here that when we talk about chemical control, uh, it really is irrespective of whether we're talking about a, um, a, an organic, what we would call an organic or biorational uh, chemical, or whether we're talking about a conventional chemical. Uh, so, uh, I, you know, the principles of IPM work whether we're discussing that as a uh, as an organic production method or as a conventional. Uh, uh, pre uh, pre conventional production method, uh, and certainly I would say that you know if if you are interested in organic production, uh, then the principles of IPM are even more important because of the importance of those cultural methods uh, and other methods to support your uh, your production. Uh, so, you know, one of the first things that that I like to talk about is the importance of scouting. I come out, you know, my, my first introduction to all of this is through entomology, uh, and there sort of is a bias uh, in a lot of how we talk about uh, integrated pest management uh, to talk about um, talk about it from the from an entomological or an insect based perspective. Um, but the principles really apply more broadly, and we can talk about that. Uh, for insects, for diseases, uh, for weeds, uh, and sort of incorporate it, that all. And I, I kind of turn that P from uh, uh, pest to plant uh, and try to make that uh, you know, integrated plant management uh, when we talk about uh, you know, growing, our, growing the plants that we enjoy growing. Uh, so scouting is going to be very important. You know, I have uh, you know, given some notes on this before. Uh, you know, the principal advantage is that you're going to be able to detect problems early. You're going to know uh, that those uh, potential pest organisms are there. Uh, you can evaluate whether that is going to be uh, a serious issue for your production or not. Uh, you can you know, get them identified. Uh, and it really does allow for more options when we're choosing management techniques. So uh, if we can identify those problems early, uh, then it's a lot easier to, to maybe use mechanical control uh, or use a, uh, uh, you know, a, a pesticide that's going to be a little bit more targeted uh, rather than using, uh, using something else. Uh, as part of this, of course, one thing that we need to do is we need to know the plants that we're growing. Uh, and you know, part of that is just learning what's normal for the plant and what is not. Um, and you know, the example or the two pictures that I have here, uh, one of these is a variegated plant and one of these is a diseased plant. Uh, and in the time since I put this slide together, honestly, I have forgotten which is which. Uh, and so certainly it's going to be important for you to know, you know, what's normal for the plants in your landscape, you know, what, you know, leaf colors are you expecting? And so when you start to see, you know, something change, uh, then you can start to look for what's causing that to change. And that could be as simple as, you know, water or a nutritional issue for the plants or fertilization, uh, or you could have a pest or disease. So really important to know the plants that you're working with. Uh, it's also important to be able to identify and know the common pests for the plants that you uh, are growing. Um, so, you know, if you're growing vegetables, uh, know the plant, know the insects that you're very commonly going to see on them. Uh, know some of the diseases that are going to be really common for that. I encourage you, you know, the uh, MSU Extension Service has a number of publications uh, related to some specific plants and some specific problems that you're very likely to see on them. Uh, similarly for insects. Uh, so, you know, if you familiarize yourself with those pests, it's going to be really easy to identify them. Uh, really easy to know what steps you can take in order to get an effective control, because you know even if we're talking about chemical control, uh, the chemicals that will be effective in managing a caterpillar pest, 
uh, and what might be effective in managing a stink bug can be very different. Uh, and of course, I, I do have to note, you know, if you have a difficulty in, in uh, identifying an insect, uh, it's always possible you can take a picture, uh, send it to your county extension agent. Uh, you can bring it into the office and have us take a look at it. Uh, we'll be happy to tell you exactly what it is and give you a recommendation uh, for what the, what the best method to control it would be. Uh, one method that can be used for monitoring is the use of sticky traps. Uh, this is a really easy way to detect uh, small flying insects. Uh, so you might be able to sort of identify things like uh, white flies or leaf miners or gnats. Um, you just use a, a, a yellow cup, you turn it upside down. Uh, you can coat it with something like Tanglefoot. You can buy it at most garden centers. Um, and they fly up, they're attracted to the color yellow in, in a lot of instances. Um, uh, there, there are some differences in how different insects are attracted to different colors, but yellow is a good color to go with. Uh, and you can kind of get an idea of what's coming in uh, just by checking the trap. Now, you'll, you'll see in some, time, in some places uh, that they recommend the use of sticky traps as a method of control. <clears throat> and that really, you know, it just isn't very effective. It's not going to catch enough of them uh, to seriously reduce the population. Uh, but it does tell you when things arrive. So it can be really important for part of your, your monitoring or your scouting uh, for pests in your garden. Uh, and over time, you can kind of develop uh, an idea of when things tend to show up. So that's another really important opportunity uh, where you can spend some time uh, you know, making sure you have those records because that can really help. So keeping a, a garden journal, uh, you, know, you know, sort of a, you know, what's been going on, how you manage things, how effective that management was, uh, all gonna be really important, really easy to, uh, to reference. Um, and when you're, you know, if you do come in to talk to a county agent, having that gar garden journal makes my life phenomenally easier um, because you can hand that to me and I can look at what's been going on uh, and that will give me just a vast amount of information to work with as I'm trying to help you. So, you know, what, what your plants are, what variety they are, uh, notes about any symptoms that you see, um, you know, take a picture if you can, uh, that's always a, a great method. Uh, and uh, you know, keeping those records, again, really beneficial in the future. Uh, one thing that, that is a really key element as we talk about pest management, integrated pest management, is that whether something is a pest is not, you know, that, that's, a, that's a human designation uh, that we put on, a, on an organism. Uh, so a pest, you know, really is dependent on how many of that particular thing is present. So uh, you know, one, uh, one caterpillar uh, may not be a, a serious issue, but five could certainly be. Uh, you know, one grasshopper, not going to cause a lot of serious problems, but if you have uh, a swarm of locusts, uh, certainly that presents a, a very different uh, situation. One, one individual is very rarely going to cause sufficient damage. Uh, that's not universally true. Uh, certainly, you know, the, the idea, you know, a single, uh, you, know, you know, some caterpillars, if you have a single tomato hornworm, uh, that can do quite a bit of damage to your plant. Uh, but, you know, our idea here is we're not necessarily attempting to remove all of the insect or, or potential, you know, uh, plant feeding insects uh, out of our landscape and out of our garden, uh, we're just really just trying to keep the number of them down below a level where they can cause damage. So, um, you know, kind of key to that idea is the idea of an economic injury level or an aesthetic injury level. Um, and that is, you know, we, we again, we're coming from background where we're talking about agronomic crops, we're talking about cotton or soybean, um, we're, you know, we're talking about, you know, whether that produces a, an economic loss, uh, and that may be difficult to apply uh, in a garden, but 
uh, we can still look at it as being, you know, at what level are we, you know, making it worthwhile to us to go out there and apply a control. Uh, and so you can, you can kind of uh, have a, a, an idea of a population level of a pest where you're going to be getting some loss. Um, and, you know, as long as that population remains below that level, uh, then we're fine. And we're, you know, using cultural methods and other uh, techniques to prevent that population from, uh, from getting to a point where it's damaging. Uh, but when it gets above that level, that's when we want to apply a control. Uh, and so that, that's sort of the idea uh, that we have for scouting is that lets us know what that population level is. Uh, in the case of some pests and, and you know, the population level it's going to be damaging is going to vary from pest to pest. Uh, the, the damage caused by one aphid is going to be quite a bit different uh, than the damage that can be caused by a tomato hornworm. Uh, so, you know, how much we're willing to tolerate that uh, is going to vary uh, both from plant to plant and from, uh, from uh, pest insect species or pest insect species. Um, but again, we really want to consider a lot of different methods together uh, when we talk about pest management. And the key there is to use cultural management, use biological controls, uh, and use chemical ma chemical management, all in concert in order to achieve the best result. And so, uh, making sure that we have you know the proper fertilization, the proper plant choice, uh, you know, are supporting beneficial insects, uh, and then when necessary, applying the the the, uh, the chemical controls that we need to, uh, all is going to give us the best result. Uh, so I'm going to spend a little bit of time talking about cultural control of insect pests. Uh, a big part of that comes down to what we're growing. Some things uh, tend to have fewer or less critical pests than others. Um, I don't think tomatoes versus sweet corn is a particularly great example uh, because both of them can have some uh, pests that are quite critical and can grow to quite large populations. Uh, whether that be a uh, you know, corn earworm is a really good example. Uh, corn earworm, which is also known as tomato fruit worm, um, is a serious pest of corn and is a serious pest of tomato uh, and certainly would require some pretty significant uh, you know, management. Uh, okra is maybe an example of a plant that, or a vegetable plant that just doesn't tend to have uh, a large number of, of insect pests associated with it. Uh, so, you know, a little bit easier to grow uh, without a lot of intervention. Uh, another really good example of that, you know, crepe myrtle um, is, is really a, just a fantastic tree for the landscape uh, because, you know, for one, it, it's just an extraordinarily attractive plant, and it also has relatively few pests. So, uh, you know, crepe myrtle aphid is uh, one issue. Uh, and that's sort of why it was really striking when we've actually had the introduction of a uh, of crepe myrtle bark scale, uh, which is now a significant pest of crepe myrtle. So, uh, you know, consider your crop selection. Consider you know how much you're interested uh, in, uh, in in managing uh, different problems in selecting your crops. Uh, when you are selecting plants, resistant varieties can be extraordinarily important. Uh, whether that be for insect pests or for diseases, um, particularly, you know, if you're worried in, in vegetables, uh, resistance to different soil pathogens can be really important, uh, as well as resistance to viruses. Uh, and that's another element where having records and kind of keeping an idea of what you've seen in the past uh, can be really beneficial because it can help you select out uh, those resistant varieties that are going to be really beneficial for you. Um, another part of that is growing plants when pest populations are low. Uh, oftentimes those uh, populations are going to increase, uh, whether we're talking about insects or disease, the populations increase as we go through the year. Uh, so planting early can be really advantageous because it allows us to avoid those high populations later. Uh, though there are some examples where planting late can actually be beneficial uh, so planting late for things like cucumber uh, or melons uh, can allow you to avoid uh, early populations, things like the cucumber beetles 
uh, or in the case of peas and beans, you can avoid bean leaf beetles. That's the picture down there at the bottom. Uh, rotating crops, again, both important for insect and disease pests. Uh, if you grow the same crop in the same location year after year, uh, that, uh, that problem will build up in the area. So being able to rotate and grow something different can be really beneficial. Uh, and I often, you know, when we talk about this, I often uh, sort of uh, revert or, or, you know, kind of base everything talking about a vegetable garden. Uh, but certainly this same principle applies when we're talking about the, the annuals that we put in to our landscape, um, because they have the, you know, the exact same issues. Uh, and so if we rotate those annuals, you know, not only do we get the virtue of avoiding some insect and disease, disease problems, uh, but we also get to uh, sort of introduce some new color and some new interest in our landscape. It's also important to uh, include good weed control in that. Uh, weeds serve as alternative hosts for both diseases and insect pests. Um, and uh, we don't often apply our controls to them. Um, so, you know, certainly tilling is a, uh, uh, you know, a major part of that. And we'll talk a little bit about some other weed control as we go through the presentation. Um, sort of on a large scale, you can include trap crops as part of your strategy. A uh, trap crop is applied just to attract pests away from your main crop. Uh, so some good examples there is, is sunflower is very attractive to leaf-footed bugs. Uh, and so you can plant sunflower uh, away, you know, slightly away from where your uh, main crop is, attract those leaf-footed bugs there. Collards have been used to attract uh, diamondback moths. Uh, southern peas have been used for stink bugs. Uh, the important thing in a trap crop is that you have to remember to close the trap. Uh, so uh, once that population has been attracted to your, your non-crop plant, uh, you want to go ahead and apply a, you know, apply an insecticide to that to, to uh, eliminate that population uh, or at least re severely reduce that population. Uh, otherwise, they will grow in population and, and move off into your other crop. Uh, sanitation is going to be a really important element there, destroying old crop residue. Uh, <clears throat> will you know, eliminate a lot of immature insects, eliminate overwintering sites, both for insects and for disease. Uh, and uh, I don't see, you know, certainly don't see this very much for homeowners, but using reflective mulches uh, can reduce some, uh, some aphid and thrip populations. Uh, but uh, not, again, not something I see very frequently for, uh, for homeowners. Uh, mechanical control can be a, an important element in insect and disease management. Uh, just providing a physical barrier between the plant and the insect. So uh, a good example of that is a, a cut, cutworm collar. You can see that down in the, uh, the bottom image there. Uh, cutworms come up out of the soil. They see the barrier rather than the plant, and so they avoid your plant. Um, low covers, <coughs> which you see up in the top there. Uh, just going to be a, just a physical barrier uh, that, uh, that prevents access to the plant so the insects can never get there. Uh, and insect netting can be used even on some larger plants. Uh, and in some cases, I integrate some insect netting because it also helps me stave off the birds uh, who are attracted to my tomato plants. Uh, of course, biological control is, is something that people are very interested in. Uh, whether that's the use of uh, insect predators, things like lady beetles, uh, which are, uh, are very common and sometimes people will release them out into their garden. Uh, assassin bugs and, and parasites like braconid wasps. You see a caterpillar that has been afflicted by braconid wasps up in the top right. Um, there, there are even fungi that are used to help control uh, caterpillar populations. Uh, so the cordyceps fungus can be used for that. Um, and you can see the, the cordyceps fungus gets into the caterpillar uh, and, uh, and kills it. Uh, the the uh, reproductive stru structure then comes from the uh, caterpillar. Uh, so, you know, in, in managing biological control, of course, we want to avoid insecticide sprays because our insecticide sprays can be damaging to our, benef to our beneficial insects. Um, 
we want to uh, plant a diverse range of uh, plants because that's going to attract more. Um, and you know, when we talk about you know lab rearing of uh, of uh, or uh, release of biological control insects tends to really be effective more in greenhouses or, or protected structures uh, than it does in the garden, simply because those predators tend to spread out uh, and don't maintain a high population. Uh, so I left in an extra slide there. Uh, banker plants are another way that we can attract beneficial insects. Uh, banker plants basically have a non-crop pest on them uh, that allows us to maintain a population of beneficial insects in the uh, in the area. Some examples of that is crepe myrtle aphid. Again, it's an aphid that feeds really just specifically on crepe myrtle. Uh, and so you can maintain populations of lady beetles on it uh, that can then spread off to your uh, to your other plants. Um, barley has been used for the the bird cherry oat aphid similarly. Uh, and Papaya can actually be used to support populations of wasps uh, that'll help control whitefly popula populations. Uh, so again, you know, making sure that you have plants that are going to favor beneficial insects is going to be really important. Uh, you know, grow some flowers near your vegetable gardens uh, that are going to provide good living space. A lot of the beneficial insects as immatures feed on insects, um, but as they get to their adult stage, the adult stage might be nectar feeding. Uh, and so you wanna make sure that you're providing that food source for them. Uh, and you're also gonna make sure you're uh, applying water sources as well. Um, grow that diversity of plants. Uh, you can include nursery strips. So sections where you have flowers uh, that bloom at different times, that's gonna help support them. Uh, and of course, you want to avoid using plants that are a host to a major pest for the crop that you're actually growing. <clears throat> Mechanical control is uh, another important. Uh, we already talked a little bit about you know using barriers or insect netting, um, but another element in uh, mechanical control is the use of lures or traps. A lot of these will use a pheromone attractant, uh, or and occasionally. Uh, so for the pheromone attractant, of course, in uh, uh, large-scale agriculture, often that is used for monitoring moth populations. Um, but it's also used, and you can see an example of a beetle trap uh, up in the, uh, the top image there. Uh, and that has an attractant for Japanese beetles to it. Uh, and so the beetles come into that and get trapped in it. Uh, and, uh, and that you know, can keep them away from your plants in addition to uh, you know, uh, just letting you know that you have the issue there. And uh, there are some plants that, uh, that are associated with you know, having a repellent uh, activity. Uh, so herb plants, uh, you know, things that have a really strong aromatic uh, quality to them. Uh, can be used, and in some cases, things like uh, lemongrass extract uh, or garlic and other materials like that, cinnamon, uh, have been used as sprays uh, as what we call an antifetant or a repellent. Uh, there's not, you know, to the, the extent that I've been able to, to look it up at least, uh, a lot of good information on how effective that is, uh, but certainly, you know, having some of those plants around can be a uh, uh, attractive and and uh, and useful as well, uh, so I certainly think that it's worth a try. And you know, when we're talking about a small number of plants, there's absolutely nothing wrong with hand removal. Uh, if you just have a small number of pests, if you just have a small number of plants, uh, just physically removing the pest and and throwing it out for the birds uh, is perfectly acceptable as well. Uh, we already mentioned a little bit, and I want to just uh, talk a little bit about resistant varieties. Again, this can be really important for uh, the control of diseases, also for insects. Uh, and you can see kind of strikingly how, how much those resistant varieties can, uh, can have an impact. Um, so when you're selecting plants, you know, particularly because you, you know the history of where you're growing things, selecting out varieties that have uh, resistance against problems you're expecting uh, can be really beneficial. Uh, using tomato as an example here, <clears throat> because there is a, 
you know, there are all sorts of different codes and, and resistance qualities and in, in varieties of tomato. Um, but you see this as well in, uh, in ornamental plants, uh, as well as other vegetable plants, uh, you know, particularly uh, for, you know, the, the major disease pests for a particular plant. Uh, and, and breeders work very, very diligently uh, producing plants that, that have those resistances uh, and they're well worth it in terms of their, their performance in the landscape. Uh, that being said, you know, you know, all of that being said, insecticides and other pesticides are always going to be an important element of pest management. Uh, there is a wide, wide array of different uh, chemistries and chemicals on the market. Um, whether we're talking about a, a, what we would call an organic insecticide uh, or a conventional uh, insecticide, um, you, you know, either approach that you take, it's perfectly okay. Uh, again, we're applying this when we need to, to provide effective control when the other methods have not allowed us to keep the pest population below a level uh, that we would consider that action threshold uh, for our plants. Uh, and then we wanna make sure that we're selecting an insecticide that's going to be effective for the problem that we have. Uh, so it's really important that we understand uh, the use of what we're, we're you know, uh, taking care of. Because insecticidal soap, you know, it's really effect, it's very effective for management of things like aphids or things like uh, uh, white flies, <clears throat> uh, but it you know, really works on the immatures. So you know, we need to know, kind of know what to expect out of that, that chemistry uh, and use it in its proper role. Uh, pyrethrin can be very effective and very broad use for controlling a lot of different insect pests, uh, but it also doesn't have much in the way of residual control. Uh, so, you know, we, we want to make sure that we're kind of understanding uh, the, the thing that we're working with. And a really important part of that uh, is, is understanding and reading the label for that particular pesticide. Uh, and so, the information that we're really looking for on that pesticide label, it's gonna tell us the, the crop, make sure that the crop that we're growing is on there. Now, sometimes it will just say vegetables or ornamentals or you know annual flowers. So it may list a broad range of crops. And as long as you fit within that range, you're okay. Um, but you do want to make sure that you're applying it in a use that 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 chemistry is is there for. Uh, you're also going to want to make sure that the pest that you're trying to control, so particular caterpillar or stink bugs or what have you, are listed on that label. Uh, you also want to make sure that you follow the directions for mixing and applying the chemicals. So making sure that you're using it at the right rate, that you're applying it properly. Uh, and, you know, there are, you know, directions, you know, on all sorts of different chemicals, organic and conventional, uh, for using protective clothing. Uh, and we want to make sure that we're keeping ourselves safe. An additional element to that, uh, particularly for vegetables and fruit crops, uh, is a pre-harvest interval. So after we've applied uh, this pesticide, you know, how long is it until we are able to harvest that, uh, that material? Certainly, we should all be washing uh, all of our fruits and vegetables before we eat them. Uh, and also, you want to make sure that you're following directions for storage and disposal. Uh, a lot of the stuff just can't be thrown away in the normal trash. So uh, sometimes it is necessary to uh, you know, take that to a, a, a hazardous waste collection center or, or something like that. Uh, so, you know, good example here, kind of a made up uh, uh, chemistry there. there. There is no such thing as two vaporizing in dihydrogen monoxide. Uh, and, but kind of gives you an idea, you know, you're going to see there um, where you can use it. Uh, unless you have a pesticide applicator uh, license, you wouldn't be able to use this because it's restricted use. Uh, it's going to tell you what its mode of action is. A lot of times that's maybe more, but you want to pay attention to the active ingredient, uh, pay attention to uh, things like first aid, uh, any precautionary statements, but really importantly, the directions for use are down there. Um, 
and uh, that's going to help you make sure that you're using it properly. Uh, and use properly, they are an important tool uh, as part of, of the management of different insects and diseases in the landscape. Uh, I've already mentioned, of course, you do want to limit your best applications to promote beneficial insects. That being said, you know, if that pest population has gotten to a point where we're applying a, a pesticide, the beneficial insects have not been able to keep that population down uh, below that level. So it, it is time to apply that control, but we want to select a pesticide uh, that's going to be effective uh, and, and, you know, do as a uh, uh, do that with as little off target or you know action to other things as well. A good example that I use for that is thuricide. That's that BT insecticide that I talked about way back at the beginning, uh, where uh, BT is really just effective, or that version of BT at least uh, is just effective against caterpillars. Uh, so you can apply that, get effective control of caterpillars. Um, works much, much better on early stage or very young caterpillars than it does on, on grown up ones. Uh, and uh, you get effective control and you don't have as, you know, as much concern about any off target action there. Uh, so just a, a couple of notes here as we get towards the end, <clears throat> I've tried to make sure that I, I mentioned throughout that you know, these principles really apply to, uh, to disease management as well as insect management. Um, in terms of disease management, that cultural control is going to be really important. Uh, I always try to get people to keep the disease triangle in mind uh, where you have a susceptible host uh, and the pathogen is present uh, and you have a favorable environment, that's when you get disease. So all of our cultural management uh, really comes down to attempting to knock one leg out of this triangle. So we can have a host that's not susceptible. Uh, if we can have an environment that's unfavorable, we have a pathogen that's not virulent or the population of the pathogen isn't high enough to cause a problem, then we don't get the development of disease. Uh, and so here's another slide I'm sure you've seen before uh, on the cultural control of disease. Uh, I think really one of the most important elements that we consider uh, in disease management is sanitation. Uh, that's removing, uh, you know, any plant debris, uh, removing any, in some cases, removing plants that are uh, suffering from the disease issue. Uh, and that just prevents them from serving as an inoculum source or a source for that pathogen spreading in the environment. Uh, watering uh, in such a way as to keep, you know, keep water off the foliage uh, is going to help uh, significantly in reducing diseases because fungi and bacteria require a long period of time with the leaves being wet or with the, the plant being wet uh, in order to allow that disease to establish. Uh, resistant varieties, again, uh, probably the easiest way to avoid disease uh, simply by selecting a plant that, that's uh, you know, going to be uh, resistant to it. Uh, though I do think it's important when we talk about resistance, it, it's very much in the same way that we talk about a water resistant watch. Um, there, there is no watch that's waterproof. They're water resistant up to a point. And so very often resistant varieties <coughs> um, may still see some symptomatology or some signs of the disease, uh, but will generally show it much, much, much less uh, than would a, uh, a, a variety that's not tolerant. Uh, mulches can be an important part of disease management, uh, just uh, you know, providing a little bit of a physical barrier between the soil and the plant. Uh, and of course, making sure that you don't introduce any diseased plants into the landscape can also be a, a major element in the cultural control of disease. And finally, you know, weed management falls into this as well. Uh, and a lot of weed management, when we talk about um, sort of integrating weed management, uh, making sure that you have good fertilization of your plants is going to help them get up big and strong where they can outcompete the weeds. Uh, I see this very frequently in working with people and their lawns. Uh, one of the best things we can do to promote, uh, you know, getting weeds out of our lawns uh, is doing a good job fertilizing. 
because that is going to uh, allow our grass to grow lush and just out compete the weeds that are trying to grow in it. Uh, as we're talking about other kind, you know, you know vegetable beds or ornamental beds, uh, using mulches is a great way to just you know, block out sunlight and to prevent the weed from being able to establish um, water management where we're not over applying water. So we're just, you know, applying, you know, drip irrigation systems are very good for this, uh, where we're applying water just to the base of the plant, not watering other areas of the landscape that don't need it, and making sure that we're applying the right amount of water uh, so that the plants are thriving uh, is going to be really important. The healthier our plants are, uh, and this is true for insects and diseases as well. The more we promote the general health of our plants, uh, the better we job we do of all sorts of the, these forms of different forms of pest management. Um, just like mechanical control for insects, uh, physical control or mechanical control for weeds is, uh, is always going to be part of that. Uh, so using hose or, or using your hands, uh, just physically removing weeds uh, it is certainly an effective uh, management tool, uh, particularly when you keep those weeds at a low level just from uh, all of these other methods. Uh, that being said, there's certainly a time and a place uh, for the use of herbicides, uh, particularly having a good uh, herbicide strategy, uh, using pre-emergent herbicides, uh, using appropriate herbicides for what we're going to be trying to, uh, to control uh, all of the same rules that we want to follow for insecticides or chemical control of diseases, uh, we want to follow when we talk about weed management as well. So, you know, as we talk, go back and kind of think about cultural control, all of the techniques that we use really kind of come together uh, and, uh, and work together. Uh, so proper insect management and disease management and weed management uh, will all integrate with one another uh, and the methods for one really do help in establishing the methods for others. Uh, so I hope that you know you'll be able to to use some of these principles uh, in uh, in your landscape. Uh, and you know th this is sort of the same approach that we're using in uh, in broader agriculture. Uh, and so I, I think it's very valuable that we we understand that as well. Um, you know, I, I certainly talk about, uh, you know, uh, the, the technology of, of production a fair bit. Uh, and I think that one of the important things that we need to consider when we talk about the idea of sustainability, uh, which incorporates, you know, things that are beneficial to the environment, uh, beneficial to us economically and beneficial to us as a society, uh, is that the, the pathway to sustainability is to use these technologies uh, and use them uh, you know, with knowledge and use them responsibly uh, so that we can, we can really keep all of those elements of sustainability together. Uh, so I really appreciate your time today. Uh, I hope you enjoyed this presentation. Uh, if you're listening on YouTube, uh, congratulations. <coughs> We're uh, at the end of the presentation. If you have any questions, uh, you can go again, put those down in the comment section. Uh, and I look forward to be able to uh, come back and answer those. So thank you very much. Uh, and if you are listening here, uh, I will be very happy.